It's John Reed, Diginomica, and I'm rejoined by the usual suspects to try to make sense of what SAP is doing part three. Josh Greenbaum and Jeff Scott, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, John. Yes, so if you tuned into our last one, you heard like a really vigorous debate on SAP's innovation strategy. And Mm. what's crazy is how much has happened since then. And so it seemed important to come back. But I think what we were really mostly motivated by together was to really try to look at how does this affect customers? Because even though I think our debate last time was like really good for what customers should be thinking about, like all these issues raise big questions as to what a customer's priority should be at this time and how do you deal with the vast complexities of things that are going on, but also be successful in what you're trying to do in your day job, right? So that's simple. I think that's kind of our goal today, right? Is to see if we can break that down a little bit. Uh, John, you'll be happy to know that uh, I have gone completely caffeine free today, so I am I am not going to come out of the gates. You super like amped up and yeah. So now now you get kind of this puppy's know, dry, right? man. I'm already yellow, I'm there. Jeff. Relax, semi catatonic, Jeff. We might get grouchy, Josh, if we're not careful though, because Josh Josh is like his tipping point on hard. AI discussions is not I, very I'm, much so i'm taking i actually have a glass half full perspective to give today I'm wow okay Excellent. Limited, but, but important yes i'm looking forward to that so i'm just gonna just do a very quick rundown before we begin of some news items because they're kind of hanging out there and we may get back to a few of these later in the show but since our last discussion there's been ongoing debates and discussions and user group positioning around this whole notion of SAP's innovation strategy and in a nutshell, whether it should be tied so closely to RISE or not. And there's been some new statements put out by UK ISUG and and DSAG around that. But I get the sense the tenor is shifting a lot and there seems to be a little better dialogue at this point on that with SAP. So I I think we're going to set that to the side a little bit today, but that is still kind of out there in terms of the best ways to move forward. But then also SAP did announce a major 8,000 job restructuring that was supposedly AI driven that also involves some reskilling. And, and that still needs a lot more meat on the bone in terms of what that means. Um, so we may talk a little bit about that as well, because there's some inside baseball stuff around changes in product leadership and go-to-market stuff involved in that also. Um, and one thing that I would point out is that these are not layoffs per se, as they have been explained so far, which was rampantly misunderstood. So some people may have even seen articles that implied that, but at the moment it's viewed as voluntary and that those jobs would actually be replaced by the end of the year as well. So that's an important sort of thing to note. Um, SAP stock price is doing very well. So Wall Street is at least happy with SAP right now. I have some ideas on why that is, but so those are some of the major items. And then we also have some board reshufflings that are rather significant. And uh, and then also a, a, a supervisory board change of notes. So there's a lot going on, and some of that's going to get hashed out at Sapphire as well. So that's sort of the backdrop of this discussion. But I think in the middle ASUG of it, ASUG annual conference. Yes, thank you. And ASUG annual conference co-location. Thank you, Jeff, for that prompt. I'm sorry I missed that on my end. Mm-hmm. Um, at the same time, same place. And so a lot we'll of later. those things, a lot of those things are going to play out um, in Orlando. Uh, But at the moment, what we really wanted to sort of get into is sort of one of the core things at the center of all these themes, obviously, is is AI. What does it mean? How is it impacting customers? And so that was sort of the starting ground here. So, Jeff, you were the one who originally kind of proposed we we reconvene on this topic. So what were you kind of thinking as to why that would be important to do today? I think for most enterprise customers, of which all are SAP customers, right? In the sense that if you're an SAP customer who we're talking to today, most likely you're an enterprise customer, right? This concept of artificial intelligence and gen AI is at the top of most of the conversations, right? It, um, it, you know, it, it is on the mind of the CEO. It's on the mind of the board. It's on the mind of all of the senior leaders. So what does this mean for a CIO? How do you really think about what this Gen AI, Gen AI thing could be for you. And we're already seeing lots of manifestations of it, right? Microsoft Copilot, Bard, Gemini, um, SAP's tool, Jewel, right? Um, you know, internally with inside of ASUG, we sat down a week or two ago and talked about what are all these tools we're even using internally. And we came up with, the, there's lots of them. We came up with four, right? That we're really probably using on a semi-regular basis. A couple of them we're playing with, right? So Grammarly being one, 
The second being a tool that helps us kind of manage meetings in real time, you know, speech to text, and then using Gen AI to summarize meeting notes and and, and content notes. Uh, we are we are playing around with Copilot, and then uh, you know we're we're doing you know some things with ChatGPT. How do you how do you make sense of all of this, right? Where do you place it? How do you use it? You know, none of this, in my particular view, it's all very interesting. But I, you know, these notions that it will dramatically reduce headcount needs—I'm not seeing that instantly. It, all of it's intriguing. It's all brand new workflow, right? In the sense that most of these require you to step out and do something in order to energize it. Um, when we think about our SAP investments, what does Jewel mean long term? What does it mean for our master data? What does it mean for our legacy data? You know, if if we're messing around with messy data. What's the risk that that data gets into these models and actually, instead of helping an organization make decisions, actually hastens making bad decisions? So I, I think there's a lot to talk about here. And I think there's a lot of, hey, you know, ChatGPT demonstrated you could ask it any question and it'll give you an amazing answer. Why can't I do that internally inside my organization? What's taking so long? Right. Josh, Josh, I want to get to you in a moment. But the one thing I just wanted to add, Jeff, to what you said that I think is a different dynamic here. And I had an interesting debate with a vendor at a show of theirs recently, not SAP, where the vendor was a little more taking this practical approach to AI around like, well, first of all, Gen AI is not the only kind of AI. And second of all, we're just going to embed this into products. And when it solves our customers' problems, they don't care whether it's AI or not. Like they, they want to solve problems. And, and I think to a large extent, that's how I generally view like next gen tech is kind of through that lens. But there are some important differences here uh, in addition to that dynamic, which is the rogue use of these tools and rogue adoption by employees is forcing the issue because the stats on this are, are rather high depending on what you know study you look at, but 50, 60%, depending on departments, using these tools, playing around with these tools, potentially playing around with these tools with IP from your company that shouldn't be used. So there is some pressure and, and you can ban certain tools. One in four companies have, according to a recent survey yep. I saw today. But banning tools, let's not kid ourselves, that doesn't solve or address these issues in any like meaningful way, I don't think. And then also, to your point, on the board level, people po prodding the C CEO and saying, what is going on with our AI strategy? And so there's, I think those pressures change this a little bit from just, oh, let's Let's take that narrow look at solving a business problem. Companies have to have answers to this and employees want answers also. And so that doesn't mean that you immediately go out and spend a huge amount of money on projects. And in fact, a lot of companies aren't spending a huge amount of money on AI projects right now, but they do need to answer these questions. And so that's kind of why we're gathered here mm -hmm. today. And Josh, I wanted to ask you one thing, which is like when I think about ASA Tech Connect, what I think about is that there was really good insight into AI and where customers are at. But that was hardly the only thing they they were wanting to talk about. They were they wanted to talk about clean core. They wanted to talk about BTP. They had a lot of S four things that are just bread and butter stuff around skills and business case and end of maintenance stuff is looming. So, what is your take on like just in general how we fit all these pieces together? Because we can't just talk about this one thing. Well, you know, and, and I think unfortunately there's a lot of uh, bad bad research and bad PR around. The benefits, potential benefits of AI. I've been looking at um, a number of studies. I'm going to name some names. McKinsey, PwC have have been just, frankly, doing the world a disservice by talking about the hype. <clears throat> that hype is driving, of course, as you said, boards to ask CEOs. <clears throat> excuse me. So when I look at who's talking about what, TechConnect's a great example because at TechConnect we talk to a lot of practitioners. People with, you know, rolling up their sleeves, getting work done, showing up because they need a, they need answers. Those folks are, are concerned with, with real world problems. Right now, AI is not a real world problem. But the higher up the food chain, I go in my conversations and I get to the C level and they're like, uh, you know, I got I to gotta have an answer. I've got, I'm reading these studies. They're telling me my peers are, <clears throat> you know, doing X, Y, Z. I have this fear of missing out. So I want to play this game to a certain extent and at least at least pay lip service to it. That that practicality seeps into almost every conversation. And you know, it doesn't matter whether I'm at a SAP centric conference like TechNet or I'm off often in anybody, any other vendor's uh, ecosystem, the practitioners, the people with day-to-day -day problems and to solve are are okay with 
in talking about AI, but they got, they'd rather have a real practical solution to a problem they can solve today and not two years from now. And Josh, you, you said you weren't feeling grouchy today, but I do want to revisit your grouchiness for a moment around what mm. does tend to make you grouchy, which tends to be a lot of times around data. Can you get into that a little bit? Because I think this whole data quality thing is really at the center of this conversation. Yeah, you know, and I, I, I again, I can't have a conversation with a customer or with a, someone who's been w- rolled up their sleeves to work with a customer without hearing about how bad their data is. I was just, you know, responding on on LinkedIn yesterday to yet another one of these studies. I think it was referencing a McKinsey study, and the, <clears throat> this individual was saying, "Well, you know, supply chain that's going to be a great place for us to do, you know, incredible AI modeling and and predictive and analytics." And oh my goodness, I have worked, we all have worked in supply chain. We all know that that you know there, there's multiple bills of materials, multiple payment <laughs> structures, multiple suppliers, things change, stuff gets swapped out. And you want to do historical analysis on that kind of data, <clears throat> you're gonna have to clean up a ton of data before you even get to potentially the right amount of data to do it, you know, a, a a strategic analysis. And as I keep saying, I think I've probably said it in in front of the two of you as well. <clears throat> the best thing I can say about the whole focus on AI, it's just, it's a, it's going to bring us to a much needed inflection point about how we deal with our data. And if all this does at the end of the day is get enterprises to look at data quality and data governance and do a better job of it and really think strategically, Bingo. You and I, just quickly, you know, we ran into a company at another, someone else's show last week, a small subsidiary of a, of a larger a, a Swedish company called Asa Abloy, which is a, a you know, a, a, it's basically a roll-up. They've bought 200 companies in the last few years. Uh, Asa Abloy is doing an S4HANA implementation. I shudder to think at how they're going to reconcile those 200 acquisitions and, and roll up that data. And that's going to be a hell of a story. But if they get it right, then they've got, you know, then they can, and when they get it right, because they're going to have to, then they can really deploy S4 and do some amazing things. So data, data, data. Right. Jeff, can I ask you how that. this stack, Jeff, can I ask you how this stacks up with what you're hearing from the ASEC board and from your customers, the kinds of things Josh is talking about? Absolutely stacks up, right? I think about two things. I think about data relevancy. So when I look at where I am today, is the data that's behind me even relevant anymore? And there's a lot that's inside of your SAP environments that I could argue is interesting, but not relevant, which is Josh's point about supply chain. Yeah, five years ago, we used these set of suppliers to do these things, but we've moved on for various reasons that the system may know about or may not know about. The system just knows that you stop buying from them. It doesn't maybe know why, but you stop buying from them. So was it because they didn't provide the part anymore? Was that you didn't like the quality of the part? What was it? So, you know, is it, you know, is the data you have in these systems relevant? And if it's not, how do you make that determination and how do you get it out of the model? And then the second thing I think about is, you know, accuracy. So is it relevant and is it accurate? And if it's not accurate, it's also not happening. And so yep. when you eliminate all the data that's in your SAP environments that is irrelevant according to who and is inaccurate how much is left that you can actually do something with and yep. we know that these large language models require a lot of data to be driven so if it's inaccurate data and it's not relevant and it's gone what are you left with i think josh is spot on i i think you know the dawn of this is the dawning of the age of saying i need really good master data I need really good archiving, and I need someone to really understand that these historic, incredibly important transactional systems actually have to be able to produce long-term analytical information that can help drive decision-making. And they were never really quite set up to be that. Now, were they? SAP SAP was set up, and it's an amazing tool, was set up to make sure that when data goes into the system, it's properly formatted. It's consistent. It's connected. You know, you can't do a purchase order if you don't have these things. You can't do a sales order if you don't do these things so that we produce a general ledger. It's accurate. It's amazing at that. We've never asked it to be in a tool that is amazing 10 years later 
and we're going to wind the clock back 10 years and say, I can absolutely positively put back together again what happened 10 years ago. And I know it can inform the decisions I need to make next year. So let me walk, walk the listeners through just a few things on what we've learned around the enterprise nature of, of AI. And a lot of this you can also see in my Digenomic articles. I wrote a big one on AI projects. It's more general. And then I issued part one of my article with Philip Hersing that gets into SAP's AI strategy, part two forthcoming. And we won't cover all of that today, but in general, and Jeff alluded to accuracy, one of the challenges with these models is that especially in the freelance sort of chat GPT environment, that these models are notorious for problematic output. Um, The good news for enterprises to an extent is that those things can be modified with the proper corrective type of data architectures that that SAP is plotting as well as other vendors that involve things like updating generic models with customer and industry specific information and providing various guardrails that in, that increase the caliber and quality of of the output. So that's sort of the good news, um, but there are still going to be accuracy issues. There's still going to be outliers and and then there's a risk assessment scenario. The EU AI Act provided a really nice framework of different types of AI and the types of risks. So in other words, like some things are kind of obvious, like job descriptions is going to be a less risky procedure than something pertaining to employee hiring and screening and analysis. And so, so risk is also a big one in terms of how to evaluate this. But the good news, I think, is that there are improved. Uh, accuracy use cases for the enterprise. But the the bad news or the good bad news, depending on how you want to look at it, is that the components of that include things like data quality, which of course is an overdue conversation, but it does need to happen. SAP thinks it has some fresh answers there in terms of SAP data sphere. We could talk about that perhaps. Um, I would add cloud to that mix. Now, it, you don't have to run cloud to run AI, but SAP was very definitive, Philip, in, in the interview with me around how a lot of their best results on these projects that they've experimented with have come from cloud. And then when you look at AI at scale, like a lot of that will come to cloud because everyone's got on the same basic data structure. It's not like you can't do that if you're on-premise, but it's hard to do that at scale because every on-premise customer is different. So if you're going to do AI on-premise, you may be a little more on your own in certain sense versus what the vendors can deliver. Um, And then I would add automation to that list in the sense that AI, to to an extent, is only as good as your automations as well as your data because you don't want to just search for stuff and get answers. That's just Google for the enterprise. You want to be able to trigger workflows that matter Mm. within your company. And if those workflows aren't already built, AI can't just make those happen. You you have to have those in place. So it's I think the workflow part is going to be very important. So all those sort of things are, are going to be very interesting for SAP customers because they're not necessarily as we've discussed, kind of set out to have those proper building blocks. But in general, I think what we can say, and there's some exceptions, right? With the co-pilot stuff, some of that is productivity suite stuff that doesn't require a whole lot of sophistication and that will help, you know, proof documents and stuff like that. But that's not really at the heart, I think, of what the more exciting scenarios are, like predicting supply chain bottlenecks and predictive machine maintenance and things like that. That's where the real action is as far as value, I think, in terms of big numbers and savings. So it's going to be very interesting to see. But in general, I think the customer pulse is you can do AI on your own. You can look at open source models. But I think because of the risk management stuff, customers are going to be looking to vendors to deliver a lot of their AI in the short term. We hear that again and again from CXOs of various flavors. So that puts the pressure on SAP. But that also makes it important for us as a group to try to make sense of what SAP has to offer here to customers, because that's primarily, I think, how customers are going to consume AI in the short term unless they have very sophisticated data science teams and very few companies do. Can I, can I, can I rip on? Yeah, go ahead. Um, Let me, let me jump in. You 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 go first. Okay. I I want to rip a little bit on the workflow thing because I think, you know, I've been looking a lot at SAP, you know, plans to really drive its customers towards these end-to-end processes uh, and to put things like the business network in in the middle of it. I looked at asset maintenance as a really good example. I'm looking at collaborative planning as another one. And, you know, there's a couple of fundamental things that need to change. Number one is those those workflows, if you will, are, 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 if they're not broken, they're disjointed. That's one of the problems. And because of the disjointed, the data is all over the place. That's the second problem. And the third problem is that, you know, the the individuals who are performing these tasks are, are doing a lot of repetitive waste wasted effort. So 
in a in a way, you know, AI is putting the cart before the horse, fixing that, getting streamlining those things. <clears throat> Obviously, in the in the SAP vision, now everything's sitting around this cloud, right? The SAP cloud, as you said, with the, these these consistent data structures. Um, and now we're sort of walking towards SAP's big pitch on clean core. It's not a stupid pitch. It's a really sensible pitch because it does set you up for this kind of data concentricity that in, in turn lets you actually do this stuff. So I like that approach. I think the problem is everyone's got to be a little more patient than they want to be about when you're going to be able to drive AI results from these core processes like collaborative planning, because you got a lot of remediation to do before you can get to that point. I'm sorry, Jeff, go ahead, please. No, um, I was going to make the point, Josh and John, that I think all of this is the worst it's ever going to be, right? So while we can sit here today and poke holes at, at where this isn't going to work or where it's going to have challenges, there's a lot of really smart people out there working on this, and it's going to get progressively better, which I think necessitates that we all as technology professionals watch very, very closely. And I think the iterative cycle of this getting better and better and better will continue to accelerate. So I think that uh, I'm very intrigued by where this is going. Eyes wide open. I'm not closed off to any of it. I'm watching very carefully. Different organizations will jump at different times, which I think is interesting. Um, but Josh, to your point, right? It, it, and John, you made this comment a few minutes ago. The speed of this is going to get faster and faster. It's going to necessitate that your data structures are commonized. It's going to probably necessitate that you be in the cloud. Because I don't think if you're an on-prem customer running in your own proprietary data, data centers, using your own proprietary tools with your data that has not been you know, cleaned up to match the modern core, the amount of work, and Josh, this was your point a few minutes ago, you're going to have to do to even get into some of this is substantial. And yeah. when you look at some of the, you know, we have a, a bunch of ASUG members and board of directors who are starting up data science practices. It's an expensive undertaking. You know, you're talking about millions of dollars of headcount plus right. technology very fast, right? So these, these, these projects that we're talking about are very expensive to do, back to the point that they probably need to be vendor delivered for many customers. They might be out of the reach of many customers. They have to be looked at because they are just gonna, they're going to need big results because they're expensive. Or we're all out just doing a whole bunch of R&D with no real sense of if it has any payback. And yeah, like if he told me be special. Or, or, like, oh, yeah. like it, Jeff, if you told me right now that you're going to remain an on-premise customer, but you're going to innovate like crazy, I would need to hear one of two things. I would need to hear that you're in an air-gapped industry <laughs> where you absolutely cannot have data in the cloud, and there's very few air-gapped scenarios, but there are a couple. Yeah, Air-gapped. I'm not talking about secure. I'm talking about air-gapped. Yeah. where nothing goes out or you, you probably or, money. or you're heavily invested in in data science and what have you um and run your own data centers at scale which is almost what like Facebook and Netflix and and Google do if you're that then I'll listen to your own data center argument but otherwise I don't want to I really don't want to hear it because I don't think you can make that claim that you can innovate and this kind of now I sound like you on our last podcast but but I <laughs> But I think that's true. Be that guy. Yeah. I think that's true, though, don't you? I mean, yeah, I, agree. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, yeah. and, and the folks that you described there, John, right, are probably maybe one or two hands. Yeah, that's it. Right. Yeah. So they're not they're they're not the they're not the majority. They are the absolute minority. And as, you know, as you said that, then they're also the ones that have the amount of resources that could actually pull it off. You know, they they've got the investment capability, they've got a significant amount of motivation to do this, and they have the deep pockets to get it wrong, and it's not going to matter to them. Right. We're talking about the NSA, right, at this point? Um, yeah. yeah. DOD, DOD, right? DOD. Right. Well, yeah. actually, um, yeah, if you're ready for it, I want to I sort of throw throw an idea on the table where, where I believe co companies should start, you know, looking and, and for opportunities. And and it really comes down to the following concept. Find relatively new places in your enterprise where your data is new and clean, where you're doing new things. Don't try to take the old process and, and run with it and expect an, a result 
tomorrow. You should be cleaning up that data. But in the meantime, you know, get started in, in some places where you have finite data and much greater control. And I'm going to throw AI ops into that mix. Um, okay. I'm very interested in, in what's happening in, in, in implementation. You know, we were talking before this. Uh, uh, we started the recording about um, about uh, the you know transformation suite at SAP, the the mix of cloud ALM and Signavio and Lean IX. How you know SAP is really pushing that forward um, as as their strategy for for doing you know streamlined implementations. The data inside though that that conceptualization it's a con concept. They got to really pull these pieces together. But when you look at what you can do with the data that you start collecting from the conference room pilot through the implementation into the go live and then the renewal, that's an extremely clean data set that's finite. And you can do a tremendous amount in terms of change detection, monitoring, analyzing customizations, project documentation with AI that's going to that's gonna really make things sing in a very important part of your, your infrastructure and a very important part of your, your innovation cycle. So yeah. it's 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 not that sexy, but it's a, it's a very I think doable place for AI driven innovation. Ash, I think it's yeah. a wonderful walk before you run, you know, kind of analogy crawl before you walk. Right? Can we use some of these tools to help do data cleansing? Can we use these tools to help drive test scripts? Can they maybe do testing on our behalf? Can they help elevate the quality of our S four migrations? When we think about moving, you know, to the next generation of cloud ERP, can we use these things to do some of that, which I actually think is better in our control as technology, you know, leaders and practitioners to understand that we got the output we want before we try to unload these tools on a bunch of data that we don't really understand and we worry about how it's going to give you predictive results. I think there's a lot of value in using these tools to help us do the one thing that's on most SAP customers' minds, you know more than 40% yet to go to, you know, to cloudy or free. Can you get me there faster? And can I use these tools to push the cost of migration down? And, 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 make, yeah. and make them and match my business needs more closely. Yes. I mean, it's you a win-win if it's done accurately. I would think uh, it'd be an amazing win. -win. I want to get back to the rise thing at the end, because that's an important point. Uh, and the business transformation as a service thing that SAP has always wanted rise to be but has not historically been. Um, but I, I did want to talk a little bit about this use case issue because one of the important things to note about AI is that while we, we might ideally want to have clean data across our enterprise, the way AI functions currently, you're not going to be able to have some master AI that, you, that covers all of that anyway. AI functions best in a narrow capacity right now. So for example, if you have clean data in, in service area, and I've done a use case on this, you could start looking into internal service bots that are that help your own agents essentially is the uh, equip junior level individuals with senior level know how um, and and help them to better serve queries and eventually if you get confidence you can look at putting that in front of customers but that's kind of a next step that a lot of companies are being careful about but basically across your enterprise there are going to be areas where it's worth looking at the pros and cons of equipping junior level individuals with senior level sort of capabilities of various kinds. Development chores is another thing where there's some mixed reviews around exactly how much this helps speed development. It depends on the team and the developer, but that's another really good example of, of thing, a narrow sort of use case. And so I think it's important to think about this because you, you got to be able to stack up wins because there's no way you can sell sell your leadership on let's spend the next three years overhauling our data infrastructure once again you know because the leadership's going to be like well last time you did that six months in we bought two companies and that screwed everything up again and then we sold a subsidiary and you couldn't handle that mm -hmm. so that's not going to work so you're going to have to be able to stack mm -hmm. up these these wins along the way and the way to do that is precisely i think as josh described look for the areas of where the data quality is highest and where there is a scenario where you can really help employees like function better with with some type of assistant i i hate the co-pilot term because i I've, i'm trying to ban it from the industry because i looked this up and a co a co-pilot has to be able to fly the plane by themselves so so none of these things can do that yet so i hate that term but but the concept isn't wrong which is help me do my job better 
John, I hadn't thought about your point a few moments ago, and it was really interesting that most of the the customers that we talk to day in, day out are are going through some sort of M&A transaction. They're either divesting something, selling yeah. something off, bringing something in, right? There's all this yep. churn happening. Back to where we started with this, I think our premise was you've actually got relatively solid data that you can start with. Well, what happens if your businesses are constantly moving around? And you know now someone says, "Well, turn on AI and see what it does." Well, I don't even understand the data I just got from this right. acquisition we did. Not to mention the two hundred this one company has done in the last few years, or you're you know you're Parker Gramble and you buy a forty seven billion dollar company called Gillette. How the heck right. do you turn on AI for that? Does, does the AI tell me that uh, people like you know people shave? <laughs> Okay, I, know I read a happens. really, I read a really interesting review of of Google Gemini in on the Verge, and it really surprised me how much I liked the review because I'm not so into like AI assistance for me personally at the moment. But the reviewer uses an Android phone and talked about how the really effective thing that happened was asking it to do Google related things via Gemini it understood a lot better than the classic assistant, so it could do things like send off emails to a group of people and confirm various appointments and do all this stuff. The catch was it was the Google services on the phone on the phone. Like, and this is getting back to my workflow and platform concept. Those were the things that it could do. But as far as interfacing with other apps, which could be perceived as different kinds of data silos in an enterprise context, it was unable to do anything, which ties back to this merger and acquisition thing very well, which is that this AI is going to be pleasing to people only to the extent that it solves their problems. Like for example, IBM swears by its internal um, HR assistant. And I've talked to IBM employees who tell me that they can do a lot of pretty important HR admin tasks through that interface. So, right. you know, they can provision employees and, and, and arrange leave times and they have, and they really like that experience of doing that through the bot versus like 20 screens or whatever. They can do it on the go. But that's just for HR. And, and so that's the thing is like we're building momentum in areas where, where we have those capabilities, but it, it doesn't automatically extend to other things. And that's just really important to, to keep in mind. And the headlines are so misleading. Like, like the headcount reduction thing is a fascinating one because AI right now is good at tasks, not jobs. So the reason the headcount reductions aren't massive is because you can accumulate tasks and, and reduce a bunch of tasks across a large team and maybe lose two positions, but you're not going to lose 50 positions. And there was a big headline recently about how UPS is doing these uh, AI-inspired layoffs. Um, uh, interesting point number one is that they can't lay off any of their blue-collar workers because robotics struggles still with physical movement. So that's interesting point number one. Uh, right. I do I do agree that white collar workers currently are more threatened by AI than than, than blue collar, which is an interesting twist from from uh, a couple decades ago with automation. But the other interesting thing is that the CEO talked about like that, but then later they walked the comments back and said these are not AI motivated layoffs. And when I looked into what the CEO was talking about, she said things like it's helping us with sales proposals. Does uh, you know write write more efficient sales proposals? I ask you: Do scenarios like that sound like massive headcount reduction exercises, or, no, or no. increases in productivity? Yeah, sorry. No, sorry. but I do think it challenges customers not only to have an AI productivity strategy, but to have an ethic, ethics and jobs narrative for their own employees because they need to understand what this means to them, and and not be because these sensational headlines scare people. And and part of your job as an organization right now is to realize this is not just a productivity enhancement tool. This is something that is going to have profound implications, especially as it gets more powerful. So you got to start that communications process and be upfront. And and if this is going to reduce three heads because you've been able to automate hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tasks, then I think you have to say that too. I had someone tell me that they were going to use AI to write their annual performance reviews of their employees. Oh my God. And it, it really struck me as an incredibly stupid thing to say, because are you going to tell me that you have an AI train that can look at every email you and the employee have exchanged, has been in every meeting you've been in, has uh, exchanged every team's message? I mean, so you're going to basically write a, coming back to data and data being relevant and accurate, how exactly is that AI going to write a performance review or is it just going to make it up? And if it's making it up, what a huge disservice to that employee that you're reviewing. 
Um, right. You know, and, you know, think about, but for a moment, think about that use case. I can have an AI chatbot write my employee reviews. The amount of data you would have to access over a period of time to make heads or tails of any of it is mind boggling. Mind it's a boneheaded idea, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> you, you yeah. know, you're not gonna you're not gonna get you're not gonna have any understanding of the soft skills of the of the interpersonal interactions that happen outside of the 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 proven record of emails and you know and so AI yeah. is really so AI is really get, good. Oh, tell me what emails I should read today out of the hundreds that are in my inbox. Yeah. Can you tell me the five I should really pay attention to? That that function doesn't exist. Right. And even if it did, it would pick the ones with sentiment attached to them, probably. Right. And and, and that might not be the best indicator. Yeah, we could do SEO on email. On email to get it you it to would read. like screen all my emails out. It'd be like Jeff, what's wrong with you, man? It'd be like, oh, don't read that one. Um, Most important email you got today is what did you want for lunch? We're ordering it yeah. in ten minutes out of thirty, you know, three hours ago, right? And, and Jeff, you made a, you made a really good point though, because when you look at these tools, they are really good at summarization. But one of the things you have to really look at is how sensitive is the data that's being summarized, and how much supervision of that data will occur, right? So I'd be pretty comfortable with an AI transcript of this discussion, for example, and because we're going on the record, and I'd be pretty comfortable with the transcription of most meetings. But there's a handful of meetings that I would not want to trust AI with a summary without going over with a fine tooth comb because those meetings are mission critical, right? And performance reviews, I think, are a good example of where the accuracy and the risk things conflict. And I call that the AI overreach. And 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 we're going to have to be on our guard for this because vendors every day, I get these PR things around different things that AI can can do along the lines of like, let AI write this for you. And it's like, no, I don't want AI to write my performance reviews. Let's start with job descriptions and see if you can get those right. And then we'll move on to some deeper waters, you know? Right. But your, but your comment on your example in meetings, I have a tool that does that, right? And, and it, it translates and summarizes behind the scenes. It's a great tool. I might use it once or twice a week, right? And I keep kicking myself and I say, you know, I could use it more. But if I use it more, that means I have to free up time somewhere to go back in the tool, find the meeting, have it generate the summary from it, read the summary, figure out what I'm supposed to do with it. So like the really important meetings that I know I have to do a follow-up on two or three times a week, yeah, it helps there. But it also takes me five or 10 minutes to do that. So my point about workflow, personal workflow, is some of these tools are really interesting, they haven't made it into my personal workflow yet and got me to a point where I say, you know what, if I do that, I save an hour, right? So w- what these tools have allowed me to do is stop taking meeting notes on on a on a pad of paper every time, great? I wasn't really referencing that either. I, I used to laugh at myself. I have pages of notes about stuff. I have no idea what I was thinking at the time and I never reference. So, y- you know, what are these tools really going to do and how do they really impact the workflow? And, and what most people are talking about is I want to use these tools to make a transactional impact in my workflow. I want them to reduce the time it takes me to do a transaction, customer service transaction. I want to increase its accuracy, right? But there's a lot of work that happens that isn't transactional. Look, at the end of the day, we can take a lot of the road work away from our, our, our day-to-day life. And, and by letting some some version of a bot or an AI tool accomplish that and you know and there's that's been going on forever right we've been doing invoice invoice matching and reconciliation that's a form of of uh, you know of ai and that allows a company to to surface only the the anomalous or or you know or outlier invoices and have a human look at them that's that's much better than having a clerk look at everything that stuff is great that works really well that's small ai and and i'm all for it um the you know the boil the ocean. Let's look at these big again end to end process. Like how did that invoice get generated? The life cycle of that invoice. I don't want the full life cycle of the invoice controlled by AI yet. It's too complicated and there's too many variables. Just on on this subject of like bogus AI use cases, just to give an example of my inbox, I got this one today. It's a vendor that has developed an employee recognition assistant. The tool leverages GPT technology to craft personalized recognition messages, creating a culture of appreciation and engagement within organizations. Would you want an AI tool writing recognition messages for your employees? Oh my God, that sounds like brutal. It'll send a it'll send a happy birthday to your wife too, in case you 
want to really oh, scroll. I have yeah. more to link recognition for less emails in their inbox. Yeah. Right. So, you know, if I, they're now generating tools to jam their inbox with more stuff they don't have time to read. You're great. Like, yeah. <laughs> you're amazing. Yeah, and you're great. Yeah. I'm going to send you a recognition email every hour. Yeah. Right? You were amazing this last hour. We love you more than ever. Don't know what you did, but it was amazing. Oh my gosh. Well, okay. So what I, what I want to do, cause we're starting to run out of time is I want to do kind of a round Robin on rounding up some more suggestions for what customers can do to action what we've discussed. And then from there, um, we'll, we'll maybe do a few minutes of wrap on just generally what we're thinking about heading towards ASUG annual conference. Uh, so, uh, so, um, one of you two start. What what do you think are a few of your top actions for customers? You can repeat what we already said or give a new one. Jeff, go for it. Wow, because that means Josh isn't prepared. Um, no, that means I, I'm, yeah, I, I sort of gave my big rant, but um, um, I think it, this is as I said earlier. This is the worst it's ever going to be. This is going to get better, and it's going to get better fast. So keep watching. And while you may not want to jump today, you need to know when you do want to jump. Second thing. Play, research, invest, watch, touch, you know, all those things to try these things out and see how they resonate with you. So don't just sit on the sidelines and play Monday morning quarterback. Actually get in and try these tools, use them in your workflows, see how you think they may do, encourage your employees to do the same things. And I think you'll make a lot of progress. Uh, I think a lot of worlds open up and a lot of ahas occur when you have an opportunity to actually try these out and you might be very surprised. I, I'll just, I'm going to go with one very simple one that I've used several times in customer conversations. Start with your spreadsheet problem. Just start there. You want to get to AI, start with your spreadsheet problem. Mm. You know, you, you, you got a problem with, with pushing tulips up in the yard. Maybe you need to start with the, the soil that you've got yeah. to begin with. I asked, to ask your point, I asked Copilot in, 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 Excel, what do I do with you? Like, I don't even know what, like, what? And it couldn't answer me. And it was like, I said, how do I use you? What are you supposed to do for me? It's like, uh, just real quick. Um, I, I know we, Josh and I learned at a recent user conference that Excel is the least developed of all of Microsoft's co-pilots at this point. And it yeah. is planning on enhancing that over time. But that is, I think there will be some cool stuff in Excel eventually, but it, it will still get back to Josh's problem, which is, in this case, we are looking at a vendor that integrates Excel with the system of record, which is the crucial point around Excel versus like going rogue with system of record uh, uh, playing around in Excel. Um, so my three things, I didn't cover everything in my, my Herzig article on AI direction, but I think this more general conversation was better. My three things I'm going to throw out there, one of them came from the Herzig conversation. I recommend looking at this if you haven't gotten into this yet. But the importance of prompt engineering and prompt tuning as skills inside of organizations, it's an important part of SAP strategy. And the good news is it looks quite promising that existing employees can do the bulk of the heavy lifting there. So it's not the same as needing a data science team. It's, it's something that you could easily work with SAP to upskill on. And, um, and perhaps in some cases, you might need a SQL developer, but a lot of times you'll have those in-house. So that's a promising, important skill area. I would also say for, for the executive team, just to have your BS detector on with all of this stuff, I think we, you know, I think we outlined a lot of pros and cons today that give a sense of that. Um, there's definitely successes to be had, but there, the successes are modest enough that we can't afford missteps. And finally, I will say uh, an education to all employees on risk management around using these tools. And uh, one really good example is how sophisticated things like deep fakes have already become. And there was a there was a headline not too long ago of a employee that mistakenly sent either twenty five or thirty five million I can't remember which to an external uh, fraud uh, provider thing fake and it was all based on a, a video conference of fake personas within his organization that he was convinced were real real enough to send money so that's a, that's enough of a talking point I think to make people aware like these these schemes are getting pretty sophisticated and so now is the time to start educating around how this can be leveraged in ways that are dangerous to your organization. So obviously that's the, the next sort of piece. And, and that includes things like IP and other stuff too. So those are my three things. And okay. for the wrap. So, so I just wanted to take a quick step back and just, and just ask, ask you all, 
like what else like is on your mind as we head into the spring. And I did want to throw one other thing into the mix that, that Josh alluded to, because I think this is really important, which is, you know, we had this innovation debate last time. And one thing I do want to clarify is that while I think SAP is improving rise in some really important ways right now, I, I still don't like force fitting rise onto customers beyond the point where it's appropriate. And I agree with some of the user group statements that came out around that BTP should be the primary way that AI services are leveraged so that all customers can access those services regardless of what release they're running. Now, granted, there are risks to talk through in terms of the ROI. We talked about why, but I think customers should have access to this technology through BTP. It makes sense. BTP is set up for this. Go BTP. So, so I'm rooting for BTP instead of RISE when it comes to accessing future innovations of SAP technology. But as far as RISE is concerned, what's gotten very interesting, and I heard today from Thomas, uh, Sourseg board member, uh, new role, and he's all about the things that Josh is, cares about. And in fact, we're going to hear the buzzword calm a lot this spring, which is my least favorite new SAP buzzword, unfortunately, which stands for cloud application lifecycle management. But I don't like people telling me to be calm, so it frustrates me. But um, be calm. But, Yes. But but actually, SAP and Josh is better at just explaining this to me, but SAP has compiled a considerable amount of assets around this area of business transformation services, including Signavio, et cetera. And so it's going to be really interesting to look at RISE in that context and also SAP's vow to make an enterprise architect available in some form to all customers to help them on this path. Now, I don't know the details on that. So please, you know, don't come to me if, if your SAP account rep tells you a little bit different. But the point is, SAP is thinking through some of these things. And I think that's going to be a really interesting story to watch because I'm all for making Rise a more, a more potent and comprehensive service offering for customers. I'm, I'm all for that. I just think it's customers should opt into that. But I think it's really going to be interesting to track that this spring. So that's my final thing that I'm tracking at the moment. What about you guys? I'll take the swing and then Jeff, you can play, uh, play cleanup. Um, I, think, I think two words, partner ecosystem. To me, more and more, I mean, this has always been the case, but it's 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 gotten absolutely beyond essential that SAP has to do a much better job of really building, maintaining, showing the love for its partner ecosystem, not just the global SIs, not just the, the very biggest, you know, but the real, you know, the long tail of great little companies, small boutiques. And, and great ISV partners. Some of them are already there, but to a, you know, it's it, it's almost without a doubt that when I sit down to a partner, I'm hearing a problem or two or three or four because they don't know the runway they're given, they don't know their role, they're they're worried about the elephant rolling over and squashing them. And this has to be really carefully delineated. And I think for for everyone's sake, and, and in particular in SAP stake, but all, but more importantly, it's customers. Uh, Jeff, you and I have talked about that, so we—I I know you get it. But uh, that's those are my—that's my concept for the for the for the conceivable think, six months. I think there's been one truism in the SAP ecosystem, Josh, for a lot of years. And John, I hope you would agree with this. There is no one size fits all model. Every customer is just a little bit different. Amen. They approach, approach their world a little bit differently, and sort of try to jam everyone down one single funnel. It's not going to work that well. And one of the great joys of SAP has always been that you can fit business into an SAP world or SAP will fit into your business. And if we're going to start taking all those, all those things off the table, many more and more customers are going to find it harder. Not everyone wants to fit to standard and we yeah. can't, we can't act like that's a bad thing. Right. My, my things would be this. Um, where do you as an organization, customer organization, want to land on the innovation curve? If you want to be somewhere in the middle to the far right, if you think of it as a bell curve, that's going to necessitate that you be cloud-based, you'd be thinking about SaaS very hard, and you decustomize to the best extent you can. Because if you do those three things very well, the odds of you being able to adopt innovation faster go way up, right? And so for me, when I think about, John, to your question about rolling into Sapphire in June this year and ASUG Annual Conference, I almost did it myself, thinking about um, ASUG Tech Connect later this year, thinking about where you want to be as an SAP customer. Those three things are going to be critical. Now, I'm not going to tell you they're perfect. I think we've got a long way to go as it relates to cloud, ERP, and SaaS, and an SAP model, right? But those are the three ultimate end state goals. If we really believe that Gen AI, the next generation AI is the tip of the iceberg, and we're going to want to innovate faster, we're going to innovate, we're going to need to automate, 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 then you need to not be customized. 
because it's going to it's going to be the foot that sticks out and you trip over as you run down the road. Well said. Well said indeed. I think that's where we wrap but I I'm going to suggest on the record based on Josh's comments I think maybe we should do a another one of these some point later this spring that really looks at partners and the role of partners in all of this. I think Please. a dedicated discussion on that would be really important at this time because it's so vital. And, and, and I'd love to hear from Asa too via Jeff of like how partners fit into your go forward plans as well, because it can be tricky sometimes to get that in a way where it's the right kind of dialogue with, with, with customers and not a sales pitch. So I, I think that'd be a great topic to get into. About grabbing onto a 480 volt line on a, on a Friday afternoon, gentlemen, wonderful yeah. job. Yeah. Standing yeah. in a puddle. Yeah. Right. There we go. Right. right. Yes. Right. Cool. Yeah. It's a good conversation, right. John, to have yep. it. And I, I, as you would imagine, I have some points of view. All right. Well, let's, let's, ten let's tentatively plan on that. And, and anyone who's listening, feel free to send us your feedback on things you'd like to cover as well. Cause I think we'll do these on a semi regular basis. Thanks guys. Okay. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone. I hope you didn't get too intoxicated on AI, Josh, cause we were worried. I'm feeling better. I'm feeling better. Okay. Excellent.